Awesome. Right. So now from there, we can just move on into the experiments and the results. So, Sahir, I ask you, <laughs> what did you do? And <laughs> what did you find? <laughs> uh, um, I, so for my PhD, what we did was we basically took a bunch of rats, a bunch, bunch of male rats, uh, and we made sure they were teenagers or young adults in terms of rat years or rat days. Uh, so because the idea behind that was that, um, not just idea, we we did research in our lab before, and it is a lot harder for rats to start drinking alcohol or just wi wild sprog dolly rats to start drinking alcohol when they're older. But if you think of it, that's kind of similar to humans, right? So like, if you don't start drinking young, very rarely do people pick up drinking later on in life. Um, I'm not saying they don't, but I think generally speaking, most people have their first introduction to alcohol during their teenage years. And uh, that's, that's, it goes from there. I think, uh, Jeremy, if you have any evidence to the contrary, feel free to tell me, but I, I, I would say so, right? Cause, yeah, cause... Um, my, my evidence supports that <laughs> hypothesis, yeah. <laughs> so okay, your, your opinion is definitely valuable here because you have spent your early years in a Western country as opposed to the other two participants in this podcast who grew up in India. But yeah. but, e but even then, like, when, when if you just ask, when did you start drinking, Amir? Or when did you have like your first serious interactions with alcohol? It was yeah, that, it was that around was like eighteen. It was eighteen. It was like eighteen. Um, yeah. yeah. When when you get to uni, you see people drinking yeah. alcohol. Same thing. Uh, I feel New Zealand slightly earlier, fifteen, sixteen, maybe your dad gives you a beer or something. But generally speaking, people start drinking at a young uh, around the teenage years, and similar. It's a kind of similar thing in rats because what I did was I gave them like straight drinking ethanol which means that it had no flavor. So there's no wine. There's no flavor of vodka. Rats love wine, by the way. Um, but, you don't, but you don't want to like, that's the thing. This is why we can do this with animals, right? Because you don't want this the kind of effects of the sweetness or the actual flavor to play a role in their drinking. You want just the effects of the alcohol. So what we did is we gave them like 20% pure ethanol mix uh, in water. Um, and we also gave them food and we also gave them regular water to drink. And it was basically up to them how much they wanted to drink. And we did this for a period. And we also kind of tried to mimic human drinking a bit where you'd give them access to alcohol for a day. Then you don't give them access to alcohol for another day. And then you give it again. And this idea was sort of to say, sort of to kind of mimic the idea of that even humans, generally speaking, we do not drink all the time every day, right? We drink, don't drink, then we drink, then we don't drink. And sort of giving them access of whenever access so that they could drink whenever they wanted to within a period, a time space, was kind of this idea of trying to mimic the human experience and make it voluntary for the rats. So we weren't, a lot of the research done before me has always been injecting rats with alcohol or forcing them, force feeding them alcohol or giving them alcohol in vapor form so they sniff it. And uh, so the good thing about that is you can control exactly how much alcohol a rat is drinking. We cannot control it, right? We're giving them the choice, but that's more, that's more, in my opinion, that's more kind of like uh, transferable to humans. And because that's the goal, that's what we did. We gave 20 rats alcohol as much as they wanted to drink for eight weeks. And then we took the animals who were the highest end drinkers. And we mated them with female rats who had not, who had never touched alcohol and never seen alcohol before. So any alcohol in them was from any alcohol or any effects of alcohol which you would see would have been passed down from the male rats. Um, yeah. And then we, and then the male rats basically uh, mated and then the kids which came out of them, uh, for, out of the females, uh, and I always I use male and females because of rats, so easier to just delineate that way as opposed to going through genders. Um, uh, is that the the female rats gave birth to litters, uh, and we sort of like 
did all this sort of like visual comparison. So we looked at litter sizes, we looked at the weight of each pup, so each rat pup born. We looked at like different metrics of how well how they develop their eyes opening when they started walking, when their hair started growing, when their ears started, when they could start hearing because rats are not born uh, with all these abilities like human babies are. They're born kind of half baked, if you'd say, where they still need to, uh, they, they still, their ears still need to open, their eyes still need to open, and so on. And we basically we saw the looked at these developmental milestones because they're usually very strict in rats. You know that on day fourteen they're going to start uh, walking. You know on day eighteen they're going to start grooming themselves, things like that. Um, and then we did a whole bunch of behavior experiments with them afterwards to see how their motor coordination is, how much they drink, how how does alcohol affect them? Does it affect them differently? And so on. And then we also looked at this in one generation further. So in this case, the only interaction with alcohol they had was if their granddads drank alcohol. So we're trying so we were just trying to look at whether we had the same behavior or we look had the same behavior or whatever effects if we saw any two generations down. Uh, and we did a lot of other experiments as well. We did uh, one looking at their fear and anxiety responses. So sorry, their depression and anxiety responses to see the differences there. And then we also looked at their brains and their livers for any differences in sort of liver potential, liver function, potential brain function. The project is actually still ongoing. After I finished my PhD, I left. I'm in the UK now, but uh, there's new masters and PhD students trying to take a look at some other things in those animals. But yeah, uh, that's basically, that's a rough idea of what we did. Um, I can talk about the sort of like looking at the brains and livers and the sperm and what sort of biological stuff we did, or I can talk about the behavioral stuff we did because whatever we found so far is pretty cool. Um, and yeah, that's that's a basic idea. I'm really fascinated by the concept of um, mimicry in your in your testing so you mentioned like giving them the ability to choose when to drink which is something that we as like humans with agency have yeah but then you also mentioned that you feed them pure drinking out ethanol and you're like i don't give them wine or you don't give them <laughs> it, first of all like is the mimicry to try and like sort of uh correlate their circumstances to our circumstances more closely and then how do you choose which circumstances to, to mimic? Is there, you know, like, do you put them in social situations as well? Because for us, right, as humans, often alcohol is consumed in a social situation. It's often frowned upon for a person to go and sit in the corner of their room and, like, down a bottle of whiskey. So are you putting them in, like, are you giving them the free free will to, to drink alcohol with their friends? Is it, like, a social thing for them? Or what, what are you choosing to mimic and why? Right. Uh, so this is really cool because um, we actually did a study. So for for the purposes of my study, we did not. We uh, the male rats were isolated when they were drinking during that drinking period of those eight weeks. Um, one of the reasons we did that is because we know isolation sort of uh, sort of helps with drinking. We know we know that uh, from previous research and research done by our lab at the same time. Um, we know that if you have a friend, uh, your drinking pattern sort of changes in rats as well. It's the same thing. Uh, it's, uh, but we kind of wanted to see the effects of alcohol and therefore we, we decided for the study that we're getting into too many layers, um, of things. If we are adding the social aspect to it as well, and then we need to control how much they drink. And if you have two rats in a cage, uh, trying to see which rat drank alcohol, drank alcohol from that bottle is also a thing which you need to like follow on and we didn't have the sort of like, a lot of it is like budget and what equipment we have related as well because we didn't have the equipment to be able to manage exactly how much each rat is drinking without completely isolating them um we uh yeah oh we didn't do that um but uh like like you said yes you sort of you sort of mimic uh or you try to mimic um certain aspects and then you sort of like leave out others and the way the decision goes is yeah well the one i said was the monetary decision it just depends on what equipment you have what you can do but the second thing is what you're looking at right so we did a study in our lab at this 
uh, running concurrently. Um, Claire Bradley did that, where she was looking at whether isolated rats in this paradigm, because we're trying to mimic drinking sections, and most, like you know, like I said, they drink for some time, then they don't drink for some time, which is kind of like humans. And we were trying to, mim- and what she tried to do is try to mimic that exact paradigm, but have a f- friend rat as well. So there's two rats who are together, they've been mates and see how they drink. And she found that drinking is reduced a little bit, um, which again, comes to that idea of what I mentioned before, that other people have also found that isolation tends to show you, you tend to drink higher in isolation um, than you would uh, in a group uh, or at least with rats. Um, it also shows that you change drinking patterns. I think I think her study, her study didn't look at it, but I think I've read papers which show that your the style of drinking changes, like in the sense that you might drink more to begin with in a pair, but then reduce later on. While if you're isolated, you keep drinking throughout the day, and uh, therefore you end up drinking a lot more by the end of the day. Um, however, it. it uh, there's conflicting reports in terms of like there's multiple studies which sort of look at it and then there's also some evidence which sort of says that you know that peer group drinking and particularly in humans you drink more in uh and in your groups than you would if you are alone uh because of behaviors particularly with men i think there's like public health research which shows that or which has been mentioned um but yeah there's a lot of conflicting reports about it what we do know in general is that Overall, on average, you tend to, uh, if uh, if an animal has been socially isolated, they tend to abuse drugs more than if they're with friends. Uh, some of the clear studies have come from cocaine research on that front or heroin research on that front, where a rat, if left alone with a heroin thing vial, where it just like presses a lever or a button and it gets injected with heroin, it would it'll OD every single time. It will, it will overdose, it will kill itself every single time. But if you have a friend rat with it, they might take some, but then over time they just stop taking the hair. Uh, and it kind of leads to that idea of uh, sort of like a, a substance use, a substance abuse is uh, sort of like, to an extent, is a disease of loneliness uh, is the way which, uh, which, ha- which it has been described as in certain papers. In So yeah, does that answer everything? Yeah, really interesting. Yeah, yeah. Um, 